I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the scriptures. Stay as long as you like and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. Last time, we learned about the significance, or should I say insignificance, of the number 666 in Revelation chapter 13. What we discovered about the number itself was that it was a human number, three sixes, one after another, and not a total amount of 666. We were called to be wise and not to pull out our pocket calculators or to search on Google to discover who this Antichrist will be. The Apostle John told us to rather be on the lookout for someone acting like God, claiming God-like powers, and teaching people that man is God and that he can do anything. When you see such a person, we will see that this actually is man in his fallen state, falling one short of God's number seven, trying to mimic and replace the Trinity. This is the number of mankind, 666. Now we reach the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. At the beginning of Revelation 14, we are reintroduced to the 144,000 Israelite missionaries. We were introduced to them back in chapter 7. I dealt with that chapter back in Journey Through the Scriptures, episode 33. Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5 tells us the following. Then I looked, and behold, on Mount Zion stood the Lamb, and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. The voice I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps, and they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. It is these who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. It is these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been redeemed from mankind as firstfruits for God and the Lamb. And in their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. Here the 144,000 are pictured as victors and as winners, standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. This scene depicts the Lamb, Jesus Christ, standing on Mount Zion, and therefore shows the return of Christ. Jesus has arrived. He is on Mount Zion, standing with the 144,000 victorious who have passed through the Great Tribulation. Human beings love the image of a winner, or a conqueror. We do not like losers. If they are rugby coaches, we fire them. If they are politicians, we vote them out of office. We want winners. We want people who can face the greatest danger and be triumphant in the end. I said earlier that we are being reintroduced to the 144,000 who first appeared in chapter 7. They are not reappearing for a second time, but John is merely taking us back in time to focus on them again. We are on the circular drive of Revelation's events, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and very soon the seven bowls of wrath. As the book of Revelation has unfolded and has been revealed, we saw the first vision of Christ in chapter 1, in all his glory moving amongst his churches. The seven churches described in Revelations 2 and 3 are seven actual churches at the time that John the Apostle wrote the book of Revelation. Although they were actual churches at that time, there is also a profound spiritual significance for churches and believers today. The first purpose of the letters was to communicate with the literal churches and meet their needs at that time. The second purpose is to reveal the seven different types of churches throughout history and instruct them in God's truth. And the third purpose of these letters was to use the seven churches to foreshadow the seven different periods in history of the church from the first century AD up until the present day. After the seven letters in chapters 4 and 5, we were taken up to heaven with John to the very throne of God. We saw all of this activity around the throne of God as God began to move to enact his judgment on the earth. In chapter 6, the focus changes from heaven back to the earth. From chapter 6 through to chapter 11, we are given John's visions of the judgments of God on the wicked of the world who refuse to accept the gospel. These chapters deal with the seven seals and the seven trumpets, and the theme of judgment on the inhabitants of the earth will pick up again in chapter 15, and runs through to chapter 20. Currently, we are busy in the interlude of chapters 12 to 14. 
The purpose of chapters 12 and 13 is to go back over the same period, the final seven years of human history, and not to look at it from God's side, but from Satan's side. In chapter 12 we learned of Satan's effort to destroy Israel, and in chapter 13 Satan's Antichrist and Satan's false prophet appeared. So by the time we come to chapter 14, we have witnessed the great tribulation from God's perspective and we have seen the same time of tribulation on the earth from Satan's viewpoint. Chapter 14 takes us back to what God is doing. It doesn't focus on the judgments of the great tribulation. Chapter 14 also marks a dramatic change. In chapter 12 and 13, Satan's actions are the focus. However, in chapter 14, God is in focus and three visions are recorded in this chapter. All three of these visions deal with the victory of the Lamb. The first vision focuses on the 144,000 Israelite missionaries. The second vision has to do with three proclamations of three angels. The final vision reveals Jesus who comes with a sharp sickle in his hand to bring judgment on the earth. We will be dealing with only the first vision during this podcast. I came across a wonderful inspiring quote from John Wesley when I was preparing for this podcast. He said, Give me one hundred men who fear nothing but sin and desire nothing but God, and I care not whether they be clergymen or laymen. They alone will shake the gates of hell and set up the kingdom of heaven upon the earth. In Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5, we will be reading about the 144,000 men that Jesus will use to shake the world in the closing days of this age. Then I looked. And there was the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him were a hundred and forty-four thousand, who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. I also heard a sound coming out of heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. Now the sound I heard was like that made by harpists playing their harps. And they were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one was able to learn the song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who have not defiled themselves with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from humanity as firstfruits to God and to the Lamb, and no lie was found on their lips. They are blameless. It is important to see exactly the location where these 144,000 and the Lamb are seen. The opening sentence tells us that they are standing on Mount Zion, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. This means that they were on earth, in Jerusalem, not in heaven. They are seen together with the Lamb Jesus. They are 144,000 men, chosen out of the tribes of Israel. Some of you might be asking where the church is during all these events, so let us tie up some loose ends here. According to the promise of Jesus given to the seven churches in the opening chapters of this book, he told them in several places that he would take the church, that is, the true believers of this present age, to be with him before this last seven-year period would begin upon the earth. This is what is understood today to be the rapture, or departure of the church to be with Christ. The last words of 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 17 are, And so always through the eternity of the eternities we shall be with the Lord. The trap that many believers get into at this point is thinking that being with the Lord in heaven means that they will be taken far off into space somewhere. We all have difficulty thinking of heaven as being right here on earth as well as far off in space. What we need to understand is that heaven is another dimension of existence, just beyond our present senses. You can be in heaven and still be on earth at the same time. If we read these prophetic passages carefully now, we will hopefully see that the church is with the Lord, but the Lord is on earth during the whole last seven years. The church is with Him, but invisible to the rest of the world, and ministering to the select group of 144,000 Israelites as Jesus appears to them from time to time. In other words, Jesus will be in exactly the same condition with them as he was with the eleven disciples after his resurrection, when for a period of forty days he appeared from time to time to them. At different times and in different places, Jesus was with the disciples. He would appear and then disappear, stepping back into the realm of invisibility after appearing in their midst. This is the situation here. These are not only twelve disciples, but 144,000 men of Israel chosen for a special work on earth during these last days. If you can put that scene into your imagination, you will get a much clearer picture of what is going on in these scenes. 
These 144,000 have five characteristics. Firstly, they sing a new song, which they hear from heaven. Remember, heaven is not light years away, in a galaxy far, far away. It is just beyond our own realm of visibility. They hear a great group singing the song of the redeemed from heaven. We are not told precisely who it is that sings, but you will notice that they are identified with a pronoun. Verse 3 says, They were singing a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures, and before the elders. No one could learn that song except the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Who are they? It is apparently an enormous group, because they make a sound like the roar of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. But it was a beautiful sound because it was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. What the 144,000 hear could be the church as it is with the Lord, singing His praises and singing the song of the redeemed. These 144,000 are living men who are still on earth, but they are not yet glorified or transfigured, but they follow the Lord as He appears to them from time to time. And, as we see him here now on Mount Zion, they follow the music of heaven. Only they can learn the song of the redeemed, because only they know themselves what redemption means. They too have been redeemed. Secondly, we are told that they kept themselves for the Lord Jesus only. They were separated unto Jesus. The phrase is, these who have not defiled themselves with women. These are not male chauvinists, they are celibates. This verse is not saying that marriage or sex is wrong or sinful, it is just a reference to what these 144,000 would do. For them to be married would be defiling, because it is outside the will of God for them. They are separated unto the Lord to be His, just as the Apostle Paul was. Paul tells us in several places that he was committed to celibacy. He was single, and he devoted his life to the Lord as an unmarried man. He knew it was not the will of God for him to be married. In the same way, these men follow Christ completely. They are free to do so without any ties with anyone else because they were called to a dangerous and demanding work and needed to be unencumbered in following the Lamb wherever He went. I am married. I am devoted to my wife. If I was to abandon her to follow Christ, that would be wrong. In marriage, we are not only committing to each other in companionship, we are committing to each other in everything. There is nothing more important than my wife. In the case of these 144,000 disciples, there is nothing more important than the Lord Jesus, and they are devoted to Him. Thirdly, verse 4 says, These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These 144,000 probably refer to the brothers that Jesus refers to in Matthew 25 verses 40 where he tells us that when he comes again as the Son of Man, he will sit on his throne and will judge the nations on the basis of how they treated the least of these brothers. The world's treatment of these Israelite Christians will reveal where each individual's loyalty is truly found during these terrible days of worldwide judgment. Fourthly, they are the first fruits of the harvest during the tribulation period. We already have seen them mentioned in chapter 7 verses 9 where John sees a great multitude which no man can number that comes from every tribe and nation and people and language. This multitude are the people who were saved through the preaching of these 144,000 during the Great Tribulation. Finally, they are transformed men. The 144,000 are clearly born again. In their mouth no lie was found, for they are blameless. That is, they are without blemish. They have been cleansed and changed by grace, just as we have been, through the redeeming blood of the Lamb. Jude 1 verses 24 tells us that true believers will now be presented blameless before the presence of God's glory with great joy. It will be the same for these redeemed Israelites. They recognize their once crucified Messiah and follow Him faithfully wherever He goes. But what does Revelation 14 verses 1 to 5 mean to us today? These verses speak of future events, but how can we live today as triumphant believers? We have to depend on the power of God, and we have to depend upon Him to hold us and to keep us. The benediction of the book of Jude says that God is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. So God promises that He is able to do it. Paul writes in Philippians 1 verses 4, 
that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So God promises that, and he is able to do it. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, that all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. So Jesus promises that, and he is able to do it. It is all connected to the power of God. He will keep his own. If he will keep these 144,000 saints during the most terrible time in history that the world will ever experience, then surely he will be able to keep us today. But don't take my word for it. Read what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 45.